contour maps of water tables or piezometric surfaces are an important part of hydrogeology because they tell us a lot about how water is flowing within an aquifer. This is a great example. This is a map of the piezometric surface and the High Plains aquifer. This is the biggest aquifer in the U.S. And you can see it extends from Texas all the way up into South Dakota. And these contours show lines of equal hydraulic head. We infer that the flow goes perpendicular uh, to these contours when the aquifer is isotropic. So we can learn about the direction of groundwater flow and we can get the hydraulic head gradient uh, as well from these contours. So what I want to do is show you how to go about making this kind of map. Typically, we'll have measurements of the piezometric surface or the water table at piezometers. And what I'm showing here on the right is a map that has, oh, maybe two dozen points on it. And these are uh, supposed to be piezometers. And what I've written next to them is the hydraulic head uh, determined from the water level in the piezometer. Also, on the north part of the, uh, the, the map up here, uh, there's a lake, and that's the, the, the edge of the lake. So what we're going to do to make a map of the piezometric surface is contour these points. And we do this using rules that are typical of any contouring operation, and then also some rules that we derive from hydrogeology. So the general strategy that I would recommend using is to first of all determine what contour interval you'll use and I generally recommend five to eight contour intervals uh, and so the way to do that is to find the max and the min point and divide that into five to eight intervals and I would recommend having a contour interval that's a round number. It'll just make it easier to, to do. Um, so in this case we have uh, a lower elevation of zero it appears and the upper one of a hundred or a lower hydraulic head of zero and an upper one of a hundred. Uh, so we could use a contour interval of 20 to start with. Then we're going to locate the maximum point and interpolate between the maximum point and adjacent measurements. So the strategy will be to start off here at 100 and there's 100 and there's an adjacent point 55. So we need to draw in contour intervals of uh, 20. So our first contour in interval would be 80. And we need to interpolate between 100 and 55 and between 135 and 160. So we'll start off and we could do this um, using a three-point problem type approach or we could do it by rigorously uh, interpolating uh, but I'm going to do it just by eye. I'm going to say that, let's see, if that's 80 and 60 and 55 so that's about right uh, and then there's 35, so that would be 80, 60, 40 between those points. And 80 would be right there. And between uh, 140, I could say there's, uh, let's see, I would have 80 and 60 and 40. So I interpolate between the points and then I can go and connect up these interpolated locations um, and start drawing in my contours. Now, in order to draw these contours in though, I need to know the general rules of contouring and I need to know what rules apply to, uh, to uh, contours on the water table in particular. So let's take a look at that before continuing. So here are some general guidelines for contouring. So in general contours will either form a closed curve ending where they begin or they will extend across the region that's being contoured. Okay so 
if this is our map region, then contours are either going to start here on one end and continue on and end at the other end at another boundary. Or they could go like this. That's one option. That's extending across the region. Or contours can be closed. We could have closed contours that do this. Uh, domes or basins form closed contours. So those are the two options. Things that they don't do. We can't have one contour do this and another contour do that. That's impossible. So don't ever do that. So they never cross. Got that. They're, they also will never begin or end inside a region. So we're never going to have a contour that looks like that. And water table contours will never merge or cross. Um, and contours will also, will also never split. So we'll never have a contour that does this. Okay, no branching contours. And the reason for all this is pretty straightforward because these contours are formed by lines that are created by the intersection of a plane. And let's say we have a plane like this, or a surface rather. So we have a surface, and that surface is intersected by a horizontal plane. And that line of intersection is shown right there. That line of intersection is the contour line that we're drawing here in plan view. And as a result, we have these, uh, th these rules that, that result in that if it's a continuous surface, the uh, contour line has to extend across the region or be a closed curve. And it's going to be impossible for them to cross, begin, or end inside the region or split. OK, so those are really rules for contouring uh, any simple surface. Now, from hydrogeology, we have some additional rules. Uh, if uh, we have an area where the flow, the groundwater flow, is converging, then that's a place where groundwater is likely discharging. Uh, areas where the flow is diverging are likely areas of recharge. Groundwater contours will V upstream where streams are gaining. So if we have a stream that looks like that, the groundwater contours will look like this. Um, and we'll infer that the groundwater flow looks like that. So that there's a component of flow that goes towards the stream. If the stream is losing, then the water, the contours will point downstream. So one thing that we can do is, from these rules, is where we have some points that we're contouring and a stream, often what happens is the, uh, the, the points that we're using to contour the water table are rarely going to be spaced close enough to get full resolution. So when we draw the contours, we may draw a contour that comes between these points. And then if this area is a, a temperate area with some rainfall, then mostly the streams will be um, gaining in most cases. In, in the eastern US, most of the streams are gaining. Uh, and so what we can do is just infer that the stream is gaining and draw the contour Ving upstream like so. Uh, and, and that can be done just by inference, even if we don't have the points that are required to explicitly define that curve, uh, that contour pointing upstream. OK, so that's these guys. And um, another thing that we have here is that if there's a pumping well, so if this is a, a pumping well and the water is being pumped out, then contours will be 
Um, this is a, then going to be a, a depression of the piezometric surface. And so we expect to have some closed contours that uh, encircle uh, this well. And likewise, if we reverse the flow from this well, and we've got water that's injected, then we'll have a dome or a mound, uh, and the, the contour still would look like this, except this would be the highest one. It might be something like this, 10, 9, 8, for an injection well. OK, so those are some other rules. We can use these rules, for example, to identify the locations of wells, uh, at least to, to uh, look for indicators of wells. Um, looking for these closed contours or low, um, low points in the piezometric surface. So here's another good one. A lake, if this is a lake, then we'll, we, we'll assume that this lake is at a constant hydraulic head. So if the stage of the lake is uh, 11.3 uh, feet above a datum, then this edge here of the lake behaves like a contour, like a head contour. So when we go and draw in, say, the 15-foot hydraulic head contour, we cannot have that contour cross, this, cross the boundary of this lake. It has to wrap around like that, and then maybe the 10-foot contour would wrap around like this. OK? So we know this, even if we don't have points, we know this because of the way that lakes behave. So never have water table contours cross the boundary of a lake. OK, another rule is that in general, if, let's see, if we have a stream, the stream is flowing like this, then the contours will look like this. They're pointing upstream because the stream is gaining, and it's going from high to low. So in some cases, where, where there are a few points, there may be some ambiguity about just how to draw the contours. And you may be tempted to draw a contour that crosses a stream twice. Well, you, that's going to be pretty rare. And in general, I would not do that. So we would never really expect to see something like this. Let's just draw this. Let's get rid of all of that. So if we have a stream like this, we're never going to have the 10 contour be like this and then, say, wrap around and cross it again. Okay? And here's why. Because if, if this is happening, if this is 11 and then 10, and if it crosses again, that means that the... Let's see. I'm sorry. This is... Okay, so if it's 11, 10, and then here's 10, what that means is that the head is going from 11 to 10, and then it'll be below 10, and that means then it, it comes back up. So this would be, say, 9.5, and then here's 10 again, and then, I don't know, I guess maybe we have 9. So that means there's like this bump in the, uh, the piezometric surface along this stream. So it goes, uh, it decreases, and then it increases, and then it decreases. So it may be, now, it, it just seems unlikely that that's going to happen. In fact, it seems impossible. If the stream is flowing in this direction, the head is going to be continuously decreasing. So if you're tempted to do that, don't be. Um, you, can, you can almost always find well, you need to find a solution where that doesn't happen. And I point this out because in, in the homework, there is a, a, a case where this is tempting to do, but don't do it. You can find a better solution where you don't have to have a contour across the stream more than once. The final rule is that it's, it, it, it's tempting and it's actually fairly standard to infer what the groundwater, how the groundwater is flowing 
from the contours, from the head contours. And for this to work, what we have to do is assume that the aquifer is isotropic. So the hydraulic conductivity is the same in all directions and it's homogeneous. So the hydro hydraulic conductivity is the same everywhere. So we need to keep in mind that we're making those assumptions. And then if that's the case, then the flow will be perpendicular to the head contours. So we can draw in some flow vectors like that. There's a flow vector where it's going from high to low. Um, and it's perpendicular, that line is perpendicular. And then right here, it would be, it would be like that, where it's perpendicular there. And here it would be, I guess, like that, and it's perpendicular. Okay, so we can go to individual locations and draw what the flow is doing at that particular point. Um, and we can also draw flow paths. And the way to do that is to draw a line that is, let me go and erase one of these. So if we draw a line that's a flow path, then we say, okay, the flow starts here, and I'm going to draw so it, uh, the path crosses this contour uh, where it, it's perpendicular, and then it curves, and it also always has to cross the contours as a perpendicular line. So the flow path would curve somewhat and look like that. And we could have another flow path where we start here with that point and it's going to go and look something like this. Okay. So from these flow, from these uh, head contours, we can get a set of flow paths that we infer like that where they're always perpendicular. And notice that with each starting point that I have, I get one flow path. That's a very important point. There's no way that we're going to have more than one flow path coming from this point. So I'm going to give you examples where you're going to do this, and I'm going to give you points to start your flow lines. And for each point, you should have only one flow path. For many of you, it'll be tempting to draw multiple paths. I don't know why this is, but it seems like it's always tempting, but don't do it. And it's just simply because um, we have a, a flow system that, well, basically, you can think of it, if we start at this point, there's only one path that a molecule of water is going to take through the aquifer if it starts at that point. Okay. So we have uh, these flow paths. We can also get an estimate of the hydraulic head gradient. And the way to do that is to draw this line perpendicular, basically the flow line. So there's perpendicular. And we, we have to have a scale here. So there's my scale, 100 meters. And so I measure that distance and it looks like maybe a little bit under 100 meters. So let's say that that distance is 90 meters. So the head gradient would be the difference between these contours. So one meter divided by 90 meters. So this is the change in head over the change in L. And the change in L is the distance. It's basically the distance along the flow path. Uh, from one head contour to another head contour. And that amounts to having this perpendicular line uh, or having this line that goes through these uh, contours and, and uh, crosses them as a uh, perpendicular line. Okay, so we have a way to estimate flow paths and hydraulic head gradients from the contours that we draw.